Hey guys, welcome to the Metabolic Health Docs YouTube channel. Uh, this live stream will actually be a game changer for someone you know, if not you, especially if you can't remember the last time you ever experienced an A1C in the normal range. And, you know, my definition of normal uh, is not a 7 A1C, but actually a uh, less than a 5.7. So if you know anybody who is uh, trying to achieve uh, normal blood glu glucose levels and an A1C in a normal range, take a moment right now to uh, share this video. Uh, just, just make sure they get this information because they will need it. Um, and, and I also want to make sure if there's any questions that occur during the live stream that you ask those questions, uh, I'll make sure to answer those questions uh, towards the end of me sharing my slides. Uh, either way, uh, this video will provide much needed information about how you can better uh, control your blood glucose levels. So I'm really excited to share that. And, and as I'm uh, sharing my screen, I want you guys to uh, let me know where you are. Are you in Chicago area? Are you further away? Are you not even in the United States? Share where you are because I'm always interested to know uh, who I'm talking to, where they're from, and I really uh, appreciate you guys joining. So here we go as I share my screen. And I want to start off by using a term that you may or may not be familiar with, and that term is glycemic variability, which is oscillations in your blood glucose levels or better stated fluctuations in your blood glucose levels during a certain amount of time within the day or over the course of time. And it's really important because those oscillations, if they're too high, like if you look at this, uh, uh, this glucose chart, if you notice some of these numbers are actually as high as 400 or more, and some are as low as 50 or lower. And although the average A1C is 8.0, those fluctuations can be problematic. And I'll explain why in a moment. But even an A1C of 8.0, which is an average blood glucose over 180, is a problem as well. So, so this particular example is what the average type 1 diabetic blood sugars are like in America. Imagine that the average type 1 diabetic has blood sugars that are all over the place and at an A1C level that averages a blood sugar of 180, which is very problematic. Now, what's better is when we re reduce that glycemic variability. And as you can see from the chart below, there is a reduction in glycemic variability with the uh, lower image. The problem with that is that the average A1C is the same. So although those hyperglycemias and hypoglycemias are better in this case, it's still an issue. So our goal today is to figure out how to reduce glycemic variability as well as how to get the A1Cs in the normal range. And again, that's five less than 5.7. As you see in the image to the left, you'll see a lot of glycemic variability and the average A1C in this illustration is seven. So even when you go to the right and you see that it's in a tighter range, which is better, um, I don't want like only 40% of my blood sugars if I'm a person suffering from diabetes to be in, in range. I want it to be 100% because in order to avoid the complications of diabetes, it needs to be in a normal range. So let's think about what the American Diabetes Association is saying. Good intention for sure, but they're saying the goal for most adults with diabetes is an A1C less than seven. But let's keep in mind, less than seven is an average blood sugar of 150. If it's at seven, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. Here's for, for your, uh, you know, just so you'll see the ranges, right? So even if I'm at an A1C of six, I still have a, a, a blood sugar that's 126. And I would want my patients to have blood sugars in the 70 to 100 range in order to avoid the many complications. I certainly don't want them to be at an A1C of 10, where their average blood sugar is 240. So these are numbers that you really need to know. 
you should always ask your doctor what your A1C is. And your goal is always to get it to normal. And here's why. Glycemic variability uh, leading to high sugars, which is hyperglycemia, or low sugars, hypoglycemia, have consequences. One is oxidative stress. If you're hyperglycemic, and you may be familiar with that term because many people have heard it because of COVID, which led to oxidative stress, an inflammatory reaction that uh, leads to what we call free radicals uh, looking for partners. And, and, and then when they don't find that partner, they get upset and it can really cause a lot of inflammation. Epigenetic changes, who knew that a high blood sugar could affect our genes? That's what the epigenetic means. It means that there's some environmental factor, rather it's what you ate or something in the air or something in your environment that affected your genes. Inflammatory cytokines are going to be higher with hyperglycemia, and cytokines are like little small proteins that have a lot to do with cell signaling. In other words, helping our cells to communicate. And we go over to the hypoglycemia side, you can see that platelet activation can occur and inflammatory cytokines can occur with that as well, all leading, culminating in endothelial dysfunction and damage leading to many of the uh, major complications that are related to diabetes. So our goal is to not have glycemic variability, and that's what this video is all about. Now, if you have a high blood sugar, it should be fairly obvious what your symptoms are going to be, because imagine having a lot of blood glucose floating around, and when that glucose is floating around, uh, your body is going to consider it toxic because you only have one teaspoon of sugar in your blood at a given time. So when you add maybe the equivalent of a cup of rice, which is equivalent to 11 teaspoons of sugar, uh, your body is going to try really quickly to get rid of that. And so if you're not able to manage that well because you have diabetes, uh, you may find yourself being uh, you know, thirsty because you're going to be urinating a lot and you're going to want to replace that fluid. You're also going to be hungry because in that, in that urine is a lot of the glucose that normally would be used as energy. So, uh, I mean, of course, if you get rid of the energy, you're going to be fatigued. So if you think about it in those terms, it all makes sense. And of course, you're familiar with di people with diabetes having issues with healing, and they tend to have blurred vision when their uh, blood sugar is high. Now, those are like things that happen in the moment. But the complications of diabetes are uh, fairly substantial. In fact, there are many that are not listed on this slide. These are just the major ones we all think about. Yes, there's such a thing as diabetic retinopathy, where the retinal arteries get damaged, leak, and then they put you at risk for retinal detachment leading to blindness. And who knew that there was a diagnosis, an ICD code called diabetic cataract? There's an ICD code that we... Uh, you know, put in a chart called diabetic uh, glaucoma. Yes, diabetes can increase your risk for cataracts and glaucoma. Um, we are, we're all familiar with the leading cause of kidney failure, which is diabetes, which is why the kidneys can be impacted by uh, uncontrolled high blood sugar. And many of us are also familiar with diabetic neuropathy uh, affecting the nerves in our feet and all of a sudden, we can't notice when things are not going well. Maybe we have an infection, and, and that can lead to gangrene and ultimately an amputation. Many people uh, are aware that diabetes uncontrolled can lead to stroke. It can lead to heart disease. And of course, it can affect not just the nerves in the feet, but the circulation in the feet. And not to mention and, and you would think that uh, they would have erectile dysfunction on this slide. Maybe they don't think that's a major complication. For the guys, it's major. So erectile dysfunction is now on this slide. Something called diabetic gastroparesis, which affects the nerves in your stomach and you can't properly digest is now on this slide and a whole slew of other things. But I just want to just level set with the basics. Now, let's think about a low blood sugar. Often, uh, doctors are not even asking about a low blood sugar and patients are not thinking twice about it because they actually have normalized low blood sugars. But did you know that a low blood sugar can give you the symptoms you see in front of you, which is the, it's almost like a panic attack. You're, you're trembling, your heart's racing, uh, you're hungry, 
and you're sweating. And sometimes you can even get confused if it's severe or dizzy. So those are the kind of acute things. Long-term complications, the ones we really don't think about, are the ones listed here. And, and I think the one that says at the bottom to the left, risk of death, we're familiar with that. We know a low, low blood sugar that's not treated can, can really impact you. But did you know that if your, your sugars are always low and up and down, that may impact you financially because you can't work like you decided to. It can impact how you function in society. Psychologically, you're living in fear. You're always worried about these low attacks. And, and when that occurs over and over again, and the inflammation occurs and, and the impact on your, your heart, it can also uh, impair your brain. One of the things that kind of shocked me the most about this is how uh, about 40, there's a 44% increased risk of dementia in people who have recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia. Think about that. And so it's not just a memory issue, a confusion. This is actually a risk for dementia. So we don't want anybody, whether it's ourselves, the people I serve as a physician or your friends and family to, to have to deal with this. So, so let's think about what we eat as a way to kind of level set what we need to focus on. And you've seen graphs like this maybe in the past. Um, and and it, it appears the biggest impact in terms of uh, what uh, raises your blood sugar is the carbs in your diet, right? Now, obviously, highly processed carbs are going to raise your blood sugar higher than the ones that are not. But but the carbs are the things we need to focus on. The second uh, thing we need to focus on is the protein. And you'll notice going back to the carbs, up to about two hours is when that that you know that impact is going to be. And for the protein in that second to fourth hour is when that impact is going to be. And then lastly, fat. Now, one thing that you may be shocked by and you may have never thought about is why hasn't my doctor ever talked to me about treating my protein when I am a diabetic, right? So we only focus on carbs, but it appears that the protein also raises your blood sugar. So shouldn't we think of that? Now, people who are being treated for this may uh, give themselves a unit for every uh, eight grams of carbs, and they may give themselves a unit if they know better for every 12 grams of protein. So I want you to keep that in mind so you'll understand why you have to think about this. And that's kind of the, this is the heart of this video because now you'll see what happens for people who take insulin. And, and most people watching this video are probably taking what we call a, uh, you know, kind of a rapid acting insulin, um, like a Novolog or Humalog, but very few are taking a regular or short acting insulin like Humalin or Novolin. And, but that short acting insulin is going to be very important for a person who is thinking about their protein. It's even more important for a person who's trying to reduce carbs. And if you don't have a lot of carbs in your diet, you should be focused on the protein and maybe your insulin should reflect that. So let's, and if you look at the bottom here, let's go back to the previous slide. If you look at this slide, it says the first couple of hours are carbs. If you look at this slide, the first couple of hours are the rapid acting insulin. And if we go back and we look at the protein, the second through the fourth hour is protein. Well, it looks like that second to fourth hour is where the, um, the, the regular short-acting humulin, novulin insulin is going to be effective. So it sounds like we have a recipe for a better way to treat our, uh, our, our protein or carbs. We may want to use rapid-acting insulin for carbs and we use regular insulin for the protein. Now, if you're on a low carb or keto diet or even carnivore, you're not gonna really need the rapid insulin that much because you're pretty much dealing with uh, protein and fat as the primary staples in your diet. So this message is particularly important for people who are attempting to have a low carb, keto, carnivore dietary pattern where they're not eating foods that spike their sugar much. And that's really critical in order to avoid those uh, that glycemic variability. Here's just for for just uh, your knowledge. You can see in the uh, under the generic name, you can see that there's the Novolog and the 
Humalog and some other brands. And if you go to the, and that's the rapid. And if you go to the short acting, you'll see the Humalin or the Novalin. And, and it is true that most people taking either the rapid or short acting will also have a long acting uh, like Lantus or Levamir or Traceba as the uh, drug of choice. And people who are taking it twice a day tend to be on this uh, MPH regular, which is kind of an intermediate acting with a, a regular, uh, which is kind of a twice a day regimen. So I just want you to have that. So here we, so here we are, guys. We're, in a, we're trying to get to the point where we don't have glycemic variability. You've learned already that if I eat a diet that's not going to make my sugar go too high, then I'll probably be in that lower category where the glycemic variability will be and not in the high glycemic variability ca category. That's really important because if you have to overcorrect uh, your, uh, your, you know, guess at what your, 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 you know, your carbs are and your protein, it's going to be a challenge. But if you don't have as much of a correction to make because you're not eating a lot of carbs, that's the big message in terms of, what you're going to do to be successful. We're not going to have these peaks and valleys. We're going to tighten the range by not eating a lot of carbs. And we're also going to use the right insulin to match that protein, which is the regular insulin, uh, as we previously shared. Now, this is not just Dr. Hampton, uh, you know, celebrating something that happens in my clinic. This is something that has been studied. And here's a study in pediatrics management of type 1 diabetes with a very low carb diet. Now, uh, some of the people who are listed here may be familiar to you, like uh, Dr. Richard Bernstein of the Bernstein Solution book, or uh, uh, R. David Dykeman, uh, who uh, started the um, uh, you know, uh, Type 1 Grit uh, Facebook group after having learned about Dr. Bernstein and others like Dr. Eric Westman, Dr. Yancey, and others. Uh, so I just wanted to put this study in front of you. And what they were trying to do is to evaluate the uh, control of blood sugars in children and adults with type 1 diabetes using a low-carb diet. It was a survey, online survey, uh, type 1 grit Facebook group that was involved, which sounds very non-scientific, but they were able to confirm, if you look at the very bottom here, you know, you know, they were a we obtained confer. Uh, you know, com confirmation data from the diabetes care providers. So they made sure they got the data to make sure what the people in the survey were saying was accurate. It was 316 people in the study. And, um, and what they did in this study, they only took in about 36 carbs per day. And that's what we call, you know, uh, really prescription strength, right? And look at this A1C. We're talking about 316 responded to some kids, some adults, and they had an A1C average less than that 5.7 goal of 5.67. Now, if you're a person who has never seen an A1C like that, you have to then ask yourself if they can do it. If 316 you know, people in a Facebook group can do this, so can you. They concluded that exceptional glycemic control of type 1 diabetes with low rates of adverse events, and those include those high and low sugars, were reported in children and adults who consumed a very low-carb diet. And anything under 50 carbs is considered low, very low-carb or keto. So here's um, uh, R.D. Dykeman. Uh, he's the gentleman who I suggested earlier with his son, David. They started the, uh, the uh, type 1 grit Facebook group. I think I have a link to that in the uh, video notes, and they're really inspirational. He's an engineer. I also have a link to an episode of the Protecting Your Nest podcast I did with, uh, you know, R.D. Dykeman, because I really wanted him to, uh, and I should say professor, you know, this guy is a, a brilliant guy, but he, um, he really did a good job of explaining the journey that him, David, and their wife took. Uh, here's the type one grit. Again, there's a link there. If you're a type 1 diabetic, I strongly suggest you get the support of being in this group. Uh, we also have the, the legendary Dr. Richmond, uh, Richard uh, Bernstein, who wrote the book 
diabetes solution. If you are a person with diabetes or particularly a type one, you can be a type one as type two as well. I strongly suggest you get this book. But for those who want something easier to digest, because that book is 560 pages, uh, they do have a course with Dr. Eric Westman's Adapt Your Life Academy, where R.D. Dykeman, Roxanne Dykeman, and of course, their son, Dave, who is the person with type 1 diabetes, you know, walks you through what they had to do to get those A1Cs in the low five ranges, which is the normal range, not just for a person with diabetes, but for all of us. So what are the takeaways from our live stream today? The first thing is that there are many factors that increase your uh, blood glucose level. Uh, obviously, if you don't take insulin or if you're taking um, you know, not enough because you're trying to predict what that blood, sh you know, what that uh, carb number is, what that protein number is. And sometimes you just don't get it right, right? But it's much easier if you don't have spikes, right? So if you don't have spikes because you're not eating excessive carbs, it works out better. So we got to reduce the uh, the refined carbs and, and, car and, and re reduce the just carbs in general to a level where you're less than 30 a day. You need to be aware if you're ill, you're having your cycle, if you're a female, have hormone issues, stress, all of these things will affect your, your numbers. And then, of course, when it comes to decreasing numbers, of course, if the insulin level is, uh, you know, maybe you're taking too much insulin because you didn't predict that number well, you're exercising, you're consuming alcohol. There's something called reactive, uh, you know, uh, you know, hypoglycemia from alcohol. Certain drugs, anxiety, whatever. All of these are factors. So when you're trying to have good control, it's going to really take an uh, effort on your behalf to understand. Okay, am I exercising today? You know, what am I doing today? So you can start adjusting your medicine to reflect that. Um, when you're doing a dietary pattern where you reduce carbs, it's really very simple. You eat some protein, no matter what type you like, and you're eating non-starchy vegetables. So you have salmon and asparagus here, um, the mushrooms, the asparagus, and the uh, beef, uh, in this case, is very low. This whole dish is very low in carbs. And of course, your breakfast, things like eggs and avocado, cheese, bacon, all of these things are very low in carbs. So um, the, the final thought is related to the, the most important thing, which is you need to be on the right instance. So rather you're on a pump, rather you're uh, using a, a pen and, or just using an insulin vial with uh, insulin, you need to just, you need to match your protein and your carbs to reflect what you're doing and all the other factors that are happening in your life. So that is it for that. So I really appreciate um, you guys checking that, you know, tolerating those slides because they're so important that we are, you know, kind of understanding uh, these concepts. I think they're so important. And, and with that, I'll take a look at the uh, chat and see what we have here. And I appreciate, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Brown in Washington, D.C., where our politicians are hanging out, KC, uh, you know, and that's, let me just make sure I show our friend in, in Washington, D.C. We also have KC uh, saying, hey, Doc, in Delaware, and I appreciate that as well. We have, uh, that's an interesting name. I like that spirit junkie. I like that. I think we all could have a little excitement about life. And uh, hello, doctor. Thanks for doing this. And then we have, someone in Maryland uh, uh, doing a shout out. Of course, we have a good friend, which is Sybil. I love that graphic. Uh, one of the graphics I shared, I'm not sure which one it was, but I appreciate that. And um, here's another, no one ever discussed with me dosing based on actual or anticipated food loads, let alone protein. Thanks, I'm basically chasing, yeah. You're right. And you are going to be chasing your blood sugar. And I really apologize on behalf of our healthcare system. Um, it appears to me that that study I shared is not widely known. And with that study being out there um, that the likes of Dr. Eric Westman and others participated in, 
you would think that would be uh, highly uh, regarded in the uh, medical community, particularly with endocrinologists who are charged with taking care of our brothers and sisters who particularly suffer with type 1 diabetes on insulin pumps, like my wife. And I just, it breaks my heart that they're not aware of this. Uh, they don't seem to care about protein, but clearly any, if you just search protein graph, fat graph, you'll see that it, it impacts your blood sugar. It just does. So why would we not then make adjustments for that? And so although this is news to you, I think it's news to most people who uh, are dealing with uh, diabetes because the general, if you go see a nutrition professional or an endocrinologist, they won't even talk about the protein. And so I'm just hoping as was, you know, um, I appreciate uh, ta ta Tao saying hit the like button. I appreciate that because we're really, this is a grassroots effort and it shouldn't take Dr. Hampton on a YouTube video to get this valuable information out. It should be standard of care. And it's just not. Uh, appreciate the comments that the slides were valuable. And, uh, and it said, uh, could you repeat the dosing? Um, and I'll do that. I think that's a great point. So if, if you are, and again, let me say something about that. So if you're, the best way to know what to dose is going to be based on your personal experience, right? But so I think that's really important because everybody's body is different everybody's at a certain, like if you think about David, the young man whose image we shared uh, and his dad, uh, he's an athlete. He's a quarterback for, I think, a college team. So this guy, you know, he, so, so what you want to do is um, for every um, eight grams of carbs, you want to do one unit of insulin. And for every 12 uh, grams of protein, one unit of insulin. And then, but, but when you're doing that, you want to play with that see how your body responds and then make uh, and course correct. Um, so that's how I would handle that. And I agree, Sybil, many faces of A1C. Um, some people have an A1C that's great, but they're always suffering from hyper and hypoglycemia. Their quality of life is not that great. Um, so I just think that, um, you know, again, our goal is to reduce variability, but also to reduce the overall number to 5.7 or less. And uh, here we go. My endocrine team rarely talks about specific foods. And, and again, if, if you're a type 1 diabetic, that is maybe an autoimmune disease. You don't make insulin. And, uh, but no, if you're a type 1 diabetic and you don't deal with the food, you'll never get an A1C of less than 6. It's almost impossible because when you think about your prediction, I've said this on a previous video, but imagine looking at a label and it says 20 carbs, right? The law, uh, the FDA allows for us to be 20% off. So a 20 on the label could actually mean 16 on the label or it can mean 24. So you're making, and first of all, you're not even thinking about the protein because you didn't know better until now. And so you're focusing all your attention on a number that may be off. Not to mention uh, that the insulin formulation may be off from one company to the next or one, you know, prescription to the next, not to mention that, um, you know, even just the, um, the, the, the site where you inject the insulin, is it a good site? Is it a bad site? Is it absorbing as well as it normally does? And the answer is it may not. So you're just guessing the whole time, but let's imagine now you have a person that's not having a 20 carb or a 30 carb meal but they're having some steak and some um, green beans. And the green beans tend to be seven carbs. So now you're only looking at adjusting, oh, okay, I only got seven carbs to worry about for the carbs. And if I'm off a little bit, the off part won't likely lead to hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia because you're not giving yourself as much insulin. And that's a concept that I think we have to think about and, and I think our endocrine teams need to think about this. And, and, and whether they're referring to the nutrition professional or not, we have to factor in all of these things. Let's reduce the need for a lot of insulin, which will then reduce the chances that we're going to have hyper or hypoglycemia. So I really think that that's uh, valuable. So I appreciate that. Uh, here's from Spirit Junkie. If you are decreasing carbs and increasing protein, you're also missing 
part of a dose to decrease your variability curve, it's important to teach both for dosages. Yeah. So I think ultimately as you're, a, that's a very good point. So if you're adjusting uh, for uh, protein, I think it's important that you are mindful of that, but also keep in mind that that adjustment is going to be easier because the protein tends to be a little bit smoother. You know, it's a little bit smoother as opposed to this. So as you're adjusting, you, you're, you're giving your body plenty of time to make the needed adjustments. And, and that's how I will in that. So thank you guys so, so much for checking out this video. Again, there are so many people uh, who are struggling with this. They don't know this information. So it'll be very important that we share this video with them so they'll get that information. The links in the video will allow them to have access to Dr. Bernstein's book. Just gift it to them if they're not familiar with that, to the Adapt Life course that the family, the Dykeman family are teaching, and, and, and the uh, Facebook group, uh, Type 1 Grit. Those are critical resources that everybody needs to know about, and I hope that those resources uh, provide uh, support for all the, that need it. We'll wrap up with uh, Spirit Junkies comments. Thank you for your love and support. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Until we do this again, I ask that you guys continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.